OTB's The Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship. Welcome along to The Hurling Pod, which has become inadvertently the late night hurling pod. <laughs> I'm uh, going to hold my hands up here. We were 50 minutes or so into a chat. 57. Yeah, 57. Uh, there, was, there was a preamble. We talked about the NFL. Skell yeah. gave away the fact that he hates the Chiefs as much as he hates Tipperary. All good content. We talked about the aspirations of pretty much every team in the National Hurling League for the coming year. Then I went up to check how long we had gone. And I realized that I had clicked record twice and just recorded two seconds of the podcast. And the rest of it, we were podcasting away into the air. So welcome to the Hurling Pod, take two where I'm going to basically be challenging everything that I wrote down that the lad said in the first part that I forgot to record. <laughs> but I will also take all the blame for the fact that this pod is an incredibly late release now at this stage because of said hour that we recorded nothing. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was a tough one now. <laughs> but to be fair, it's the first time it's happened. Like what, this is year three now? Yep. That's, that's not a bad return. No, we're uh, 60 odd episodes in. That's the first time it's happened. It's a very yeah. simple thing to happen. Do you know what? It's about time you get a bit of flack too. <clears throat> Me and Murphy have been getting the flack for, from, from all the people across the nation. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. mainly me from Clare and Tipperary. Yeah. It's about time now to share the small bit. I've generally been fairly squeaky clean because I'm the guy that bounces the ball between the two E and just kind of plays oh, a neutral role. And if anyone comes back to me and says, I can't believe you said that about my county, I'll always say, I'm just playing devil's advocate to make sure the lads have something to talk about. I, I don't believe in this. Yeah. And if this time when, round, I'm entirely at fault. That pod we just recorded, sorry, didn't record. That pod we just yeah. spoke about, right, was potentially one of the best pods we've ever done. It's up there anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I actually, I actually, now that I think of it though, to be honest, Will, I reckon I figured out why you didn't press record. Because you're now doing the last word. You have people to press record for you. Mm-hmm. So you're probably forgetting about it now. Would that be it? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, look again. So, <laughs> someone said to me jokingly earlier on Instagram, they were like, "So I suppose you'd probably get Murphy and Skell to talk about hurling then." And then he added in the little caveat at the bottom, which went, "When Murph is not on holidays." And I was about oh. to bring that up on the first pod, and I thought this is pretty cutting because Murph is back from skiing. <laughs> I don't know if the same energy is going to be in this conversation that we had earlier on. Yeah, but you've made your way back, and the thing that we have realised, Paul Murphy, uh, D Tux was pointing it out earlier on. There's so many intercounty hurlers who love NFL. And then the mm. other half, and maybe there is a crossover in this Venn diagram, seem to love to ski. Shane O'Donnell, of all people, was giving you tips about the slopes. Yeah, well, I just saw he was away, I think maybe two weeks ago, that he was skiing. So I just sent him a message to see where he was. So he'd said that he'd been to the place that I was last week. Um, so there's, there's only one slope I didn't go down. It's a, it's a fairly steep slope, now, to be honest. But um, he was telling me... Well, he was trying to egg me on a small bit actually to go down to go down it. But I said I'd I'd save everyone else in the holiday having to look after me when I bust myself going down it. So um but he had gone down it a few times. So I found out that Shane O'Donnell's a fairly prolific skier from from what I know. Either that or he just threw himself down it, but he, he doesn't seem like the type of fella that uh would be throwing himself down a hill considering he's he's a doctor now, I think pretty sure, isn't he? He's a isn't he genealogy yeah. or something like that or I could be completely off now, but I do know he is. He's, he's something like that. But um, yeah, so seems to be a very prolific skier. So yeah, I don't know if there's a crossover with NFL supporting uh, GA people and the other half too in skiing. I'm not sure. Hmm. Well, look, you, you've retired from Intercounty, but for the lads who are still playing, is skiing not incredibly dangerous? Generally, that's one of the things that professional sports people have written in their contract. It's like no jet skis, no skiing, no potentially mm-hmm. hazardous stuff that you could potentially put yourself out for a long time. Yeah, but that's the difference of being an amateur sport. You don't have to sign these contracts, I suppose. Uh, yeah, it, well, I suppose it's something that's just gotten popular over the last few years. Like, I would have went twice now with Walter Welch, and he's he's a very good skier. Um, whether he's done it younger it's in school or something, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, there seems to be quite a few people that, that have gone. Like I said a few years ago, Sean Finn and Grohl Hegarty were there as well. Now, like as well, whether lads are going for a bit of crack or whether they're actually good skiers, I don't know. But um, certainly, it's 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 become a bit popular. It is risky enough, though. Like, I mean, if if you do take a bad fall, you could injure yourself. Um, but I think, to be honest, look, I think a lot of lads, GA players, anyway, if they are playing inter county and they're going skiing, in the back of your mind, you would have it in your head that's right. I'm going to take it handy enough here and you know not play with fire. Because at the end of the day, if you did get injured doing skiing, um. You know, you'd feel fairly sorry for yourself. Well, not sorry for yourself. You'd be fairly annoyed with yourself that you actually injured yourself doing something that you're you're not really conditioned to be doing. 
I'd love for you to have that conversation with Brian Cody. Sorry, Brian, I'm out for four months because I fell in Austria. <laughs> yeah, doing a black slope in Austria, Brian. You'd be proud of me. Yeah, no, that, well, that's the thing. Uh, it's it's uh, It'll be a tough conversation to have to say that you're going off. And I'd say managers would have a concern, maybe. I don't know. But... Um, yeah, look at the, at the same time. You don't have lads signed into a contract. They can they can pretty much go and do to an extent what they please. Unless you're Scal- from you never caught this, uh, this bug, <laughs> yeah. did you? So again, Will? you never caught this bug, did you? To go skiing? ski bug. I thought you thought about my my bug there from yesterday, but okay, sorry, the ski bug. Uh, you sound no. fine now. This day. that's why we're late in the first I'm place. Well, but... I'm actually well dosed up here now. I have about three or four different types of drinks beside me here because oh, you don't have to convince us. Okay, we don't believe you anyways. Okay. <laughs> 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 I tell you, I didn't expect any something. I got a text from my uncle while I was on holiday saying, you didn't bring Aideen skiing with you. And I was like, how did you know that? I said, the lads are talking about it on the podcast. I said, ah, yeah, there we go. Just hang, <laughs> hanging out with dirty laundry there in public. Just tell him, didn't even run it past me. You were just telling him, right, let's just throw this fellow under the bus. Well, look, when you put the ring in the finger, it was for better or worse, <laughs> right? I, <laughs> I, was, I was looking after her safety. I didn't want her falling, okay? Mm. That's Your why intention, I don't go skiing. Your intention is warmer climbs, isn't it, Skell? You're going to be on holidays next week. Yeah, I'm going to be on the beach. Um, skiing is not for me. Will. I have dodgy shoulders at the best of times um, on, on a level playing surface. So can you imagine what I do on a, on a slope when I'm skiing in the bottom of my feet? Probably slightly inebriated too, I'd imagine, Murphy. Yeah? Probably nice little nightlife out there. Um, so, yeah, well, the, the apparel would be popular, all right. But like, you wouldn't... Uh, like, I mean, you definitely do see people who are out uh, skiing and they have a few drinks on them. But it, it, it would be dodgy to be doing it, to be fair. But you do see it happening. But uh, usually, to be honest, once the apparel kicks in, there's no skiing done after that. Well, to be it, it makes no sense, like, because if you can't cycle the bike trunk, how are we going to go down and ski in a slope trunk? Like, well, the problem is, is that some resorts, I know we're getting into it now, but some resorts have their apparatus ski like halfway up the mountain. So you have no choice but to, you get to it, you're having a bit of crack, and then suddenly you jump into a pair of skis and you go down. It's probably dark at that stage as well. It, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, scale, you laugh. Uh, it sounds like, mad. It sounds yeah, crazy. Like, there's, there's lunatics. There's lads out there and they do it, like, you know, like, it's grand. Okay, some people have a few drinks and you, you'll be grand going down. But you see some lads fairly full now and like they're coming down the side of a mountain on skis and it's not great, like you know. But the place we were at actually anyway, you had to get a gondola to where you were skiing. So it, there wasn't the option of like lots of other places, you you literally there's bars on the side of the mountain and you can take off your skis, go into the bar. So it's uh yeah, like I mean you'd want to be some way sensible with a few drinks in you anyway, but that's that's not always the case. I'm not gonna deny the people the potential for scale ranting about the Chiefs. So we're not going to go into the lengthy chat we had about NFL, which is about bloody 10 minutes earlier on. Yeah. But two things annoyed Skell, and this is a great chance from Devent. Taylor Swift and her prominence. And that's going to be the case in Las Vegas, naturally, now that um, was it five years now in a row the Chiefs have been the top dogs, really, across the NFL, back against the 49ers in a couple of weeks' true. time. Well, they have. Let's be true here. They have, yeah. But, but this time they around, they've got, see, us, they've got us see, Murphy, fair. You haven't got a clue, right? You're just trying to antagonize me now. Even I know that's good. Like, I mean, a Patriots they haven't are the top dogs. Gone they haven't dead top dogs. And and like, you, should, you should actually be careful as well. Like, I mean, the Taylor Swift's fans, like you think now Tipperary lads coming after you for last year would be rough. And right? Taylor Swift fans have claws. So be very careful there now saying, I don't know Taylor Swift. The Swifties will be out. I reckon there's not many Swifties in Ireland. Now, like, oh, oh. Did you did you, did you see the Spotify raps at the end of the year last year? No. Yeah, everyone had Taylor Swift as their top one percent. Like, okay, I have an admission to make here, right? Her music mm-hmm. is fabulous. I can listen to her <laughs> in the gym, right? It is. It's great. I have actually a, real, a really weird music taste when it comes to the gym. The wife has actually reported about this saying it's not normal because I could have Miley Cyrus, uh, I could have Taylor Swift, Ed Sheeran in, in the gym when you shouldn't really have Ed that kind Sheeran. of music. Yeah, it's really, it's really odd. I can't explain it. Maybe okay. I'm looking for a bit of serenity or something in there. But Taylor Swift, I have been prone to listen to her music recently. I like her. Okay. Uh, but as as regards being on our, our television screen during the NFL Sundays, no, go away. Just just go away, please. Sure. Just go. She, she's not in charge of, of the cameras. Like She's at the game. Do you not think her, her publicist is, is, is talking to CBS or NBC? <laughs> focusing her. Why don't she sit somewhere normal then rather than being in the box dancing around like a, like a lunatic? You know? She can't sit down in the middle of the crowd. She's not going to sit with the normal people. Yeah. That's like Lena Messi going to a soccer match saying, actually, I'm not going to sit in the, the corporate box here. I'm going to sit down in the middle of the terrace here with the lads that are standing on the terrace. She'd be mobbed. You couldn't do that. It's more you're, being, you're, being, you're being very hard now, to be honest. I, look, I suppose I am. I suppose it's not really all her fault. <laughs> um, it's just two things. One, she's tied to Travis Kelsey, who... Um, I I you, severely dislike. Yeah, you, you don't like him. Yeah, yeah, I severely dislike. Uh, and probably the Chiefs, and also that she's taken away from the event that is the NFL. 
So now it's about her and her Swifties, like, like you just said, as opposed to the NFL. And now the Chiefs, I was praying for the Ravens. Jeez, I was praying for the Ravens to beat them. But no, here we are. Stuck with them again for another year. Well, considering lots of people hate Travis Kelsey, and mainly probably because of the Taylor Swift situation, I hate him for a totally different reason. Because start of the year, I was okay with... Uh, Taylor being forefront with the NFL, I could understand that the NFL wanted her all over the social media. It brings a new audience who probably never watched American football before. That was all fine. It is a bit grating now. And I'll admit, I was very much up for watching that game between the Chiefs and the Ravens. Mm-hmm. It was a bit too much swift. There was also a bit too much shit talking from Tyler Kelsey as well. Every time something happened during the game, he was taunting continually. Yeah, and he gets away with it as well. So like, I don't know why the refs didn't call him. And like, the one, the one player where you see Zay. Say Flowers gets caught taunting, like it's you know, it's a 15 yard penalty, and it's basically a swing of the game. But Kelsey was at it all day. He, I caught the ball like 11 or 12 times receptions, and of the 12, he probably picked up and started mouthing. And he was in, you know, more little schmozzes or rows, you could say, when they were on the run game. See, now I'm getting actually physically angry now, so I'm thinking about it's this. Fine. Look, we're and all Murphy angry because we've been here a lot longer than we planned, so I go on, let the team. anger out. Murph, Murph is like a Cheshire cat, there. just let him off, let him off. He says, like, I'm actually surprised because you're you're talking like that that like shit talking in the NFL is isn't a thing like you know like literally like the I, I NFL is known for, for like a lad makes a sack and then suddenly all the defense are up jumping around the place chest pumping all this sort of crap and you're no you're getting I angry. You. I, I hear what you're saying they're they're, they're they're very prone to a celebration after an individual player right <laughs> yeah. but to, then, then to get in the, the the opposition's face it, it doesn't happen that often. okay okay fair enough like really that. be in their face and then pushing them and it's kind of sort of half hitting them that's, that's a different yeah. story entirely. And might I say, my guy, Rob Gronkowski, would never do that. <laughs> he would never do that. No. <laughs> oh, much every, everything best, else in the book, but not that. Best tight end of all time. Leave it there. <laughs> um, you, I, I'm never going to get you to agree to say that Mahomes was better than Brady, so I won't even try, because even me saying that they've kind of taken over since the Patriots' last Super Bowl is enough to piss you off. Um, I will give a direct quote from James Skell to respond back to it, which was a quote he made not half an hour ago which was, I hate the Chiefs as much as I hate Tipperary, but I hate the Chiefs from September to February, and I hate Tipperary from February to September. I, did I say that? Because there's, yes. there's no proof. There's no proof. It's, it's, I believe it's a direct quote, which I'm allowing you to respond to. <laughs> but I won't, I won't lie. I won't deny it. I won't deny it either. <laughs> yeah, my hatred is, my hatred is seasonal. Yeah, before anybody starts, it's not on the people. It's on the teams, all right? Okay. <laughs> Because <laughs> I got that in the buttons last year. You hate to break people. I don't. It's just the jersey. And, and what comes to the jersey? Yeah, same with the Chiefs. No. You did wear one. Um, this is, by the oh. way, not the... You did. Yeah, but, there's yeah, plenty but, of evidence of it. Yes, there's, there's loads of evidence, right? But it was not willingly. It was the forfeit of a bet. So, I was, I, I, yes, I wore it. Yeah, I was being a good sport, Paul. All right. <laughs> Although I wasn't at the backstage, but I was being a good sport. No, you didn't wear it for long either. Um, this is not the NFL pod, by the way. This is the hurling pod, which is brought to you by Borgosh Energy, who are proud sponsors of the All Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. Uh, speaking of the the bets and the forfeits and all that, so I got a DM earlier from Fancy Hurling. So we have to re-register our accounts. That's the plan. So by the time people are hearing this, most likely. I should have the league code for next year. I will tweet it out uh, from the Off The Ball account. I'm sure the three of us will probably retweet it or stick it on Instagram ourselves over the next while. So there will be a league ready ahead of this week. Um, have either of you given any kind of thought to what the forfeit will be for the loser this year? No, a bit early. Is it, is it the championship forfeit is the thing or is the league one? I know. It has to be championships. Okay, championship, championship is championship, league is league. Um, no, and I think this is now the, probably the platform for anyone to suggest a forfeit. Um mm-hmm. But I know it's easy. You have to put a bit of time into that now because the stakes have kind of been been set out now in terms of Skelly wearing Tipperary jersey, which he was quite passionate about not wearing. So yeah, but it has to it has to stick more from the sense that right that has been photographed on me and that's there for life now. Right? Yeah. So what can I get you with that'll be there for life? I'm thinking of tattoo. <laughs> think of tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> that's bringing up a new notch altogether. <laughs> We're trying to raise the bar this year. I think of tattoo. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, right. Bloody hell. I'm not, I'm not I'm agreeing to go hard to go home here. A little one. I'm talking about a big flipping Mike Tyson job across the face. I'm talking about a little <laughs> one. A little left arse cheek there. <laughs> no, we'll see. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, Graham McDowell famously said, I'm not a tattoo kind of guy. Do either of you have a tattoo currently? We might. I do, anyway, yeah. I oh, do what tattoos do. do you have? This wasn't in the original one. Here we go. This wasn't in the original one, no. Uh, I, I have three. Very surprisingly, 
you might well it might be surprised by. Um, I have my parents' names tattooed. I have a Bruce Springsteen quote, and then what's the from, quote? Uh, from Dancing in the Dark. Can't start a fire without a spark. I'm just a big Bruce Bruce Springsteen fan. Nice. So I ah, did it in New York in 2013. Kind of, I was out there for a few weeks after Cork Betis, and I said, you know what, I'll do this now. So yeah, very spur of the moment stuff. And what was the other one? Oh yeah, the other one then is just myself and Jerry Elwood just got. Um, got a, got a tattoo when we were in Texas, so that was that was it then. So three. How many do you have, Kettle or where? I actually know you have one. I have one, yeah, and I was believe I actually liked them. Um, I have a, a Celtic cross on my back, mm. and I am. Um, it's just I, do you know what? It's got it's time, but I will get a hit more. I yeah. have them. I have them picked out, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I what do you want to get done? I want to get this. I have this lovely kind of design done with my three daughters' times that they're born in. Very good. It's, it's, it's clock thing. It's, it's, it'll take a bit of space now. It'll go from probably the top of my shoulder bone. You have that. Real, you have that anime though. You're all right. I've bit of space yet. Don't worry. <laughs> space. So it'll rock all that. Yeah. Um, so, something as a six foot five Capitago man, you do have a lot of space there anyway. So. <laughs> a lot of surface <laughs> area. Yeah. <laughs> the surface area is increasing by the day. Um, so it's, uh, but again, I, I probably will get it probably this summer. Give or take. That's fair play. Yeah. Okay, I think if we can put an I love the Chiefs and I love Tipperary somewhere in your bicep somewhere. Oh, oh my sweet baby Jesus. That'd be <laughs> awful. Oh, that'd be horrible, Jesus. Like, I was or thinking just... like a little Bambi deer or across your... <laughs> <laughs> a little rose, a little rose ah, across your ass. I was, I was <laughs> just kind of thinking maybe, you know, Mahomes, a greater than sign, and then Brady. How's about that? Oh. Um, we'll... It's getting, you opened this in the worms now. This is the problem. I did, but what Will just said now is not any worms, right? That that's a fucking that's a <laughs> container of worms, right? <laughs> okay. I, oh, I I can't think of actually at the worst. You know, there's a show on TV like the, my worst tattoo, whatever you call it. You know how someone else oh, yeah. picks a tattoo for a person? Yeah. I don't know what their specific name is. That's what someone could do to me now that could just hurt me. So bad that was. I, yeah. Loss of limb. Take it off. <laughs> Take it off. <laughs> so, I have it. It'll be a temporary flag for you. Oh God. Yeah. On your left arse cheek. <laughs> Specifically my left one. <laughs> I got a bit of a over there. <laughs> oh, Sorry. I love Sorry. as well that we've had our first two swears of the season, I think, there. So the 2025 Canary Islands Fund is mounting already as this episode yeah. goes on. Oh, well. Uh, right, we'll think about tattoos, but we'll join the league and we'll set the league up and that'll all be ready by the time the members pod is out definitely this week. So I, I promise to do that tomorrow morning and get it all together because uh, I didn't realise we'd need to re-register. So that's going to just take a bit of time in the morning. Uh, let's get to the correspondence that's come in from the listeners because this all stre- uh, stems from last week on the YouTube. Uh, there's a few of these that we can kind of fly through here. Uh, this was a kind of a point of information coming in from Paul Scarry for 3000. Paul Kelly won man the match in the 1993 Club All-Ireland Final for Sar fields against Kilmalik and in the All-Ireland Final for Galway against Kilkenny in the same year even though we so I must be a Galway fan lost uh, he even won man the match in the semi-final against Tipperary in the same year so that's comparing Brian Whelan 1998 won All-Ireland club and All-Ireland inter-county uh, man the match in the All-Ireland Finals so that's some going from Porra Kelly there's a few people who had asked about Porra Kelly uh, in the comments as well uh, so that one confirmed it uh, also coming in from Jay Berkey 55 Mick Jacobs goal was in the Leinster semi-final in 2004 against Kilkenny not the final in the final Wexford played awfully won the Leinster final 212 to 111 they won the game against Kilkenny by 215 to 116 I'm going to put that on myself. Again, I'm taking two faults here. Uh, I think I mentally blocked out the 2004 final and just thought that once that goal went in, Kilkenny were beaten and that was uh, Leinster for Wexford. But Leinster beat awfully in the Leinster final that year. Uh, Sean Sheehan on the greatest scores because we were talking about Dana Burke uh, last week in the All-Ireland Club final to win it. Top scores for me. One was the Joe point against Tipperary. Two, Burke point last week. Three was the Galan point from the sideline last year to level it. I think goals should be on a different list and Joe's swivel was unbelievable in reference to Joe's goal against Kilkenny in the Leinster final where he took it over his shoulder and kind of finished in the same motion. And the one that the guys are entirely divided upon, I can tell you, which came in from James Keaty, uh, who is number 3858 on YouTube. Don O'Donovan, drawn game, 2013, All-Ireland final, the Oh Holy Moses moment for Marty Morrissey. Now, so the people are not denied the fact that you're so split on this. James Scahill said earlier, Aina Burke, 9 out of 10 for difficulty. 
7 out of 10 for the other point. Murph, you disagreed, and you were in the cornerback club here. Yeah, well, I didn't disagree in the, the technical, I uh, suppose, ability of it or, or the toughness of it. Like, Aina Burke's one is a tougher one to pull off, regardless of the scenario, regardless of the pressure. Um, but for both for both scores, you have to take this situation into it. Aina Burke's absolutely outstanding, but I don't think you can underplay Donald Donovan's one there. Right? That was, like, in that game, that was, Claire wanted one opportunity to, to get a score. And, you know, each player is aware of that, that, a scoring opportunity may come up, but not to rush it in terms of pick the right one and don't just take a snapshot at it. Um, and for him to come up and get that score, like that was an incredible moment. In a Burke's technically far more difficult, absolutely, no doubt about it. But uh, given the situation that Clare were in that day and that it was the last gasp effort, you can't just write off Donald Donovan one that easy. I just think it was just um, an incredible moment that regardless if you're a forward or a back, I suppose the balls to go and actually take that on like in my memory there's two lads going in to get a block on him and I think someone just kind of I think he's even tackled after he strikes it that's my memory of it like but just you know marginal it just went over by a couple of inches over the bar I think as well like so I don't like, like I said in a box one technically excellent but I don't think you can write off the the, the enormity of the situation that Donald Donovan took that score under Scale your official ranking is in a Burke 9 to 10 out of 10 difficulty yeah 7 for Donovan uh, I did, yeah. I, I was just basing it solely on the, the, the difficult aspect of it, you know. Um, and I'm not doubting, the, 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 I suppose, the, the weight that was on Donovan's shoulders at the, at the time. Um, but in terms of, of having to execute a shot, uh, Aina Brooks is, is, is by far a more difficult one. And it was. Aina Brooks, same thing, was was a last gasp. It was their, there was their last shot, you know what I mean? And from the 21, a swivel, wet day, off his weaker side, Club final, etc. There's so many different tangibles, etc. And he 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 scores it like unbelievable. So I I just think to pull it off, if you ask someone to do, if you ask them both to do it again, like and get them 10, 10 chances, how many times would they score each? And I think one of them probably get seven out of ten in terms of chances, but Ana might only get two out of ten. So is it not harder for a cornerback to do that, an unconventional shooter, compared to Burke, who, you know, he plays in the forwards for St Thomas's all the time, and so even if it is an incredibly difficult shot to pull off. Chances are he's probably more likely to do it than a defender. Ah, uh, yeah, but you're not talking about a junior C cornerback here. We're talking about an inter, an inter- county. Either. You're talking about a senior inter county cornerback who you'd sure as hell think is able to strike the ball. <laughs> you know what I mean? For God's sake, like, and re- reality speaking, like uh, players, even even back then, I know it's ten years ago or, or, or even mm. more at this stage, like they're all unbelievable strikers. The hurdlers. You're not going back to a thirty years ago where a cornerback was only specifically able to hatch a defender, you know, or or, or less even. Not, like, whereas Nowadays and even back then, there was more of a balanced, you know, I suppose skill level you could say. And I, I don't, I don't put weight on that. I don't put the weight on his position. Um, I don't put weight on the fact that he uh, probably didn't travel up the field as much because the game plan didn't uh, perceive that. But yeah, he took the ball, put it over the bear from 40, 50 yards. Like yeah, the, the only other thing I would say with that is that Donald Donovan's was to draw the game, and Brooks was to win it. So there's a safety net in that if you're taking a shot during a drawn game to try and win it, you can take the shot. Now we're talking safety nets. Really? Well, we are talking safety nets. We're talking safety nets. Yeah. The dynamic changes. I, I said this to you previously in, in the first pod we recorded. 2012, <laughs> again, <laughs> again, the first day against G uh, in the All-Ireland final, Joe gets a free out on the sideline. Was it kind of near between the 45 and, and the 65? It's a fairly normal free in any other match, but it's to draw the game. The pressure completely changes. And he took two of them. He missed the first one. He scored the second yeah. one. But the pressure, it's completely different free. Like, I mean, if you lad stands over that free in the Welsh Cup in the league, nobody reports on it. But if you're standing a point down and you're trying to draw a game, the pressure that goes with that, they're, they're, you miss it. You're, you know, enemy, not to say enemy number one, but you'll feel terrible. If you're in a drawn game and you take a shot and it goes wide, I actually did it myself. 2016, the first day against Watford, um, we the match was drawn. I got a ball in midfield and I took a shot and I went wide. It was the last book of the game, could have won the game. Safety net though, like as in you were drawing the game, that was to win it. Whereas if that was we were a point down and I took the shot, Jesus, I'd probably still have sleepless nights about it now, like you know. So the fact that Donald Donovan had like, that was to draw the game and keep clearing the All Ireland, which they eventually won, like that's an incredible score, like as well. So, but, but at, at the time as well, you remember they got a sideline <clears throat> corrected on the QC side. Mm. They worked it, and there was a wide ball from I think probably Horgan. Time was well up at that stage. There was like a minute gone. 
Mm. But the time I don't even got it, he was like, screw it. We've no, we've no other options. No other options here. Yeah. Yeah. I'm playing nice ball into the corner. I have to go for it. So yeah. Damn it, screw it. Like <laughs> let's, let's go for it, son. It's a great <laughs> argument. It's great. <laughs> like you no chase. Very <laughs> eloquent <laughs> argument there. Damn it, screw it. <laughs> That's good. Let's go. For it. Like, uh, one of the listeners at the weekend, Murph, as well, said you had got two championship points. We have gone through the records here, and two points is doing you a disservice, I believe. I definitely have four. I could have five. I will go to but, five. I definitely have five. I'm trying to think, like, so I, I scored in my, my first game, my first championship game for Kenny against Wexford in Wexford Park. I was in Scored then. I scored against Offaly in, uh, in Nolan Park in 2014. Um, I First scored... ever match in Sky Sports, by the way, but go on. Jesus, um, shattering glass ceilings all over the place. I didn't know mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. First corner back to score in Sky Sports, so all right, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, what points did I score? I scored against Wexford again in Wexford Park. Actually, two of my points came against Wexford in Wexford Park uh, in 2019, maybe. And then Cork in 2013 in quarter final, I scored in the first half. I don't think I scored another one after that. Maybe I did, but I, I have four in my head anyway. I'm just leaving room that there might be a fifth one there somewhere. I might squeeze a fifth one. It's official. Paul Murphy's favourite opponents are Wexford, it would seem. In Wexford Park, for scoring, anyway. Two points. And after, uh, shooting the lights out is hardly what you call it. Mm, well, look, there you go. Lofty, I would say. And that corrects the record on only the two points that he allegedly scored along the way. Um, that brings us around nicely to Wexford against Galway, because we had the Walsh Cup at the weekend. What we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at the aspirations for the teams as we build towards the National League getting underway this weekend. And like the thing of it is, Scale, I don't know how much we can read into this week because you look at the teams that were out at the weekend. So players who were missing for Wexford, first of all. So there's uh, only three players were involved in the Leinster campaign match against Kilkenny, which was the most win for them last year. Jack O'Connor, who's had a flying preseason for them, Kevin Foley and Lee Chin. Lee Chin scored nine points at the weekend in that win against Galway, 121 to 16 points. But you're missing Matty O'Hanlon. D. O'Keefe, Conor McDonald, Rory O'Connor, Lee Mo McGovern, who are all guaranteed starters, I would say. For Galway, St. Thomas's players, unlike the Glen players, not involved. So no David Burke, no Conor Cooney, no Finton Burke. Uh, also, they were without Dahi Burke, Joseph Cooney, Conor Whelan, Brian Concannon, and both of the Mannions. I would say they're probably all starters on the Galway team. So that is very much a weakened team that was out there. Again, I don't know what you can read into that scale, but maybe from Wexford's point of view, They've beaten Kilkenny, they've beaten Galway, sets things up nicely going to Nolan Park this weekend if Keith Roster's side are going to have a good start in the league. Yeah, look, if, if you're well playing a game, like the, the first aspiration is to win it. Um, I think there's probably a bit of a feel-good factor in Wexford at the moment, but that can all tra- change <laughs> change drastically, let's say, when the league commences. Um, you know, with, with the new manager and a new campaign and probably you know, a two- or three-year year period ahead of him, there's this probably a sense that he's going to have to try to turn over some of the players, not t- trying to get rid of them, but blood in some some youth, take some of the twenties he's had over the last couple of years, put them into the senior team, and try set on a course, you know that 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 lasts the test of time. Because you named off players there, and this is for Wexford and, and Galway, like mm-hmm. them players aren't going to be there for the next four years, five years. They're just not. That's just reality. There's there's, there's levels to this. There's there's a pace to it all, and everyone has a window whereby they can you know execute at a high level and. In our county, for example, we need to get some, some more players in. The same thing applies to Wexford. So it'll be very interesting to see how they approach the league. Will they use the league to try and, I suppose, A, prep for championship with the current squad they have, or B, try to integrate some, some more of the youth? I'd imagine with the way the league is formed and the teams that are in each group, that they'll be able to do a bit of a balance, um, which is it's good for everyone, if you ask me. Good for the players and good for opposition and good for managers. And uh, see, see, can they unearth you know, the next... Rory Connor, our next lead chin, who can establish a place, on, a place on a team and, and move into the championship. Because I think from Roster's perspective, regardless if it's his first year or if he's trying to bring in new players, you have to be, you have to look at the Leinster title. You, at a minimum, let's say, at this level, if you're a Division 1 team who has any bit of seriousness about your tie, you have to be saying, right, we need to use the league as a platform to head into Leinster to try and win the championship. So if you can get some new players in, blood them in, uh, get a couple of victories in the league and move on into the championship after having draw a relatively successful campaign, he's happy. Yeah, uh, I think Wexford will definitely want to get a bit out of Keane Byrne this year. So last year he was great in the under-20 Leinster final. As it turned out, same venue in uh, Netwatch Cullen Park against Offaly in the Leinster final. He got 14 points that night. They've been using him a little bit in pre-season competition as well to kind of blood him at senior level. Uh, So we'll see. He got two points from play at the weekend in that game against Galway. Um, The benefits of 
playing players that have come right off the All Ireland Club, Murph, versus not playing them. So I mentioned St Thomas's lads wrapped up in wool for the last couple of weeks after the club final. I don't know how you think about, and I'm crossing sports here. I appreciate the Glen lads, three of them playing at the weekend. I like, you know, so Kieran McFall missed last year a good bit of an injury, so you would think he was probably just ready to get back in with Derry. But for Connor Glass and Ian Doherty, who've had a really long couple of years around the clock, to go out six days after winning the Ireland Club final, that must have fairly changed the celebrations for them last week. Yeah, it must have. Um, but I did see, you know, Mickey Harrod saying that. Uh, he did, the offer was there that they didn't have to come back that they, they just came back themselves like I don't know Conor Glass at all but he kind of strikes me as a fella from everyone I see on social media that he's kind of a fella that is completely uh, does what the average player doesn't not to say the average player but he, he's really setting himself apart really from what I can see like I saw a video of him during the week or not a video a picture where he was out for a cycle like you know a 60k cycle or he's, something he's in the four, full tour de France gear for his trip yeah. around the Derry Mountains yeah around the Derry Mountains so he strikes me as a fella who um, you know people may perceive that oh he wants to put the feet up now and go drink a few pints and all this stuff and maybe that's what 9 out of 10 players want to do but maybe that's not what he wants to do or what other lads want to do so it's hard to know like I mean I wouldn't look too much into it either um, I'm sure rest would be welcomed but at the same time I suppose if Mickey Hart offered that to them um, and they said no actually we want to go back in I'm sure look I mean the, the offer was made and if the players want to come back in the players want to come back in but I would say the rule of thumb generally would be that Listen, lads, take a few weeks for yourselves there. You're you're pretty much hurling nonstop for the last year. You know, take take two or two or three weeks and we'll see you then. You won't they won't have lost very much at all conditioning over that three weeks. Yeah, Scal, I get the feeling that glass particularly is built a little bit different to the average person here because in a seven day period he wins an all Ireland club, he goes down to play against Kerry and Tralee, he gets engaged in a dare manner on his way back up, and he's registered now to play in the Sigerson Cup potentially midweek now too at Ulster University which I would think he probably will get some game time during that as well. <laughs> there, there are some players who seem to just not want to stop and keep playing. Because I was chatting to him a couple of weeks ago on the, the club championship show, and he was telling me about the year before, which I think is understandable, that he wanted to play against uh, Limerick in the league just after they'd lost out against Kilmico Crooks because he wanted to just get that out of his system and play the next game. This time round, he's come off a win, one of the biggest days of his career, and he's right back out there six days later. Yeah, but maybe it's not his style. Like, so I, I suppose in cross social media, everyone, I suppose, that hammered Mickey Hart to be honest, putting the blame firmly at his at his door, making out that he he forced them back in. And like, I think it's pretty obvious that he didn't. You know, the first round of the league, to say six days after your club championship, you're not going to force the players into it because you could get, you could get a revolt. I think it was pretty obvious the players themselves wanted to play. Um, and Connor Glass, a bit like Murph was saying, he strikes me in the same mold as kind of a who could I use now? Sean O'Go helping. You know, that, that type of person who would just play would be kind of fitness orientated, a different kind of thinker than, than the normal 5 8 player, or, or a Cluxton who could who could do something very, very similar. And you know, all for it, all for it. Like some people in that team, a guarantee the Glen team, they spent all week in the pub, and that's fine, perfectly entitled. Whereas Conor Glass's probably method of, of, of release is to go back into the sport that he, he just won. So, like, good for him. There's, there's players that way who've They've, they've got their different niches, different way of of, uh, of celebrating, different way of managing their lives. And Glass is, is obviously heavily centered around GA and, and and doing his thing. Without either of you kind of betraying confidence and saying who it was, was there ever anyone that you would have seen <clears> that say didn't celebrate and maybe didn't come out with the crew or was too focused maybe in coming back to play and you felt it was a bit of a dry shot because they were doing that? Ooh, that's a good question. Because yeah. team bonding, team bonding is important. Now, that's not yeah. to say that any of these Glen lads who went back in with the Derry panel didn't have a very enjoyable couple of days in Mahara with the panel or anything like that. I'm not casting that dispersion. What I'm asking is a very general question about there are probably some lads who maybe socially don't want to go on the beer or don't want to go on the celebrations and would be more focused on getting back into the gym or playing the next game. Would you have considered them a bit dry within the panel if that was the case? We didn't have anyone that it would have been said that way about anyway. Like, I mean, pretty much everybody was of the same mindset. And, you know, we had, we had our lads who, like, obviously it doesn't revolve around drink around and but mm. you know we had lads who drank less than other players and that was just respected because like at the end of the day you, you've kind of forged a relationship with fellas in um, a really intense environment and if it's a few days after a big success whatever any player wants to do you kind of just respect it because you know that that relationship has gone to a different level we certainly had lads that were just like no listen I'm not going day two no I, I, I don't do that that's not what I'm about and there was never there was never an eye batted um, I remember like even a few times though like 
like it would have changed for me once or twice after semi-finals where you might have went for a few points the following day I found that I picked up a kind of a few doses let's say between the all Ireland semi-final and the final where I would have picked up a kind of maybe a flu or something from being wore down after first of all playing a big match of the Sunday going, going out that Sunday night and maybe going for a few the Monday the Tuesday you'd find that you'd actually be a bit run down and like back then as well the weather was changing so like you were coming into September it was getting a bit cold and, and lads were then picking up flus and stuff so I found later in, in the career like let's say that you'd be a bit cautious on a day two because if there was a match to come now if it was the end of the year fine but if there was a match to come you were kind of going well I'm going to get wore down here if I go again and like after playing a big match at the weekend I'm risking picking up something and now missing a week's training and so on so there's a lot of things that come into play when lads but if you're saying the end of the season where it's just you know that's it I think the most important thing is whatever players do to enjoy and to embrace enjoying that end of the year if it's club all Ireland if it's an all Ireland whatever if going out that night is 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 the limit for you and that's it well that's the that's the important thing for you and i think where players find the strength to go no that's me i don't have to run with the crowd here i'm going to let them off the second day that's fair enough and and i think it's important to stay true that if that's what you want to do do that do you ever have anyone scale who didn't even go to day one i would yeah like you have people let's say in our, our panels throughout the years who would be uh pioneers who wouldn't touch a drink and it's just not their style and like asking them to come with us and into a setting whereby it's surrounded by alcohol and you know it's perceived as the thing to do, it would like him asking us to go with him and do his, you know, whatever his was his release. It's just, it's just there wasn't that, um, you know, pressure applied ever to anyone because the group, like the group is full of different types of character, uh, whether that be on the pitch, off the pitch. And I, I, I agree more if everyone just kind of respected everyone's choice. So if he wants to come, more than welcome. If you don't want to come, that's entirely your prerogative, you know. Yeah. But ultimately, you were there for the simple reason that we were sharing a field together, not sharing a pub together. So that wasn't the most important thing. The most important thing was you were able to show up uh, for training, execute, and 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 play the game to a high level. That's that's what we're all there for. The, the same common goal. The common goal was not to be there on a day two or day or day three, or sometimes could be there for day four. <laughs> <It> just <laughs> you never know. Like at that stage, you're at single digits. You know what I mean? Um, but they're in every group. They're in every team in the country, man. They're in every club. They're in every Camogie team, every football team. You have the the couple of I suppose what some people would class as the outliers who just who just not wouldn't do what the group did did what would do what they want to do etc. So again, I just think it's, it's uh, like Murphy said, it's it's one of those things that has to be respected in the story. Mm. Mm. I look maybe the way those lads are looking, Derry couple of ulcers in a row, get to an All Ireland semi final with what Glenn have just done. Their feeling is maybe if they're entirely in, this could be a Division One League title or potentially yeah. an All Ireland at the end of it, and so they want to be part of that journey too. Um, Galway then, Skell. I've reeled off the amount of lads who weren't involved in the weekend just come by, yeah. and like, look, they were experimental in the other games that they played previously against Leash and the game against Offaly as well. So clearly, Henry was treating the Walsh Cup in a way of maybe giving lads a chance. Is there anyone who played during the Walsh Cup that actually caught your eye? If you're going to unearth the new player here, that's a good question. Um, see, I, I personally don't put an awful lot of weight in the Walsh Cup. So performances I see in the Walsh Cup, I give them. You know, the benefit of the doubt, I'd say, well done, but can you back it up consistently? I use the league more as, as as a barometer to see what kind of form is being produced by players that either A, are new, or B, have been there a couple of years and expected it more often. So the new players are fine. They, they'll, they'll play. I, I don't think there's a, any new players who, who, let's say, are first during the panel that are going to shoot the lights out and be a, a, an immediate let's say, impact person for the team. I look at the guys who've been there probably one or two years and saying, right, how have you been conditioned? How are you looking physically and can you make the next step? And there is one or two guys that you could say, hopefully, you know, can move things along. Like, so you're saying, like, I'm, I'm having played against McManus, Martin, Martin McManus, full forward for Lockery. <clears throat> he's, he's a good, he's a really, really good player. And I just like to see him get time, you know. So he's something that, that, that can be used. I'm looking at Kevin Cooney, who I think everyone has grown accustomed to last year. Now it's time for him to go a level like, up again. Mm. Like, he's, he was on a similar kind of trajectory as his brother Joe, whereby he was on a panel for a couple of years. Um, Watson Class is one of the main players, but then suddenly just went to, went to a different level and became one of the best players of the team. So he's capable of, of, of that for certain. Uh, and then I'm looking at, um, would you believe, a goalie, Jared Fahey. See what he can do. He's been he's been the the, the, the sub goalie for the last two seasons, like, and he's 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 had an exceptional club pa- campaign for Adrahan. So that's going to again provide huge competition to see what what can be done. And I think by the looks of it, Shefflin is is yeah, alternating between goalkeepers every every second game. So. I, maybe the form will stay true in the league. He'll do the same thing. So it'll be an interesting spot to watch. But yeah, there's a couple of guys there who've been, who've, who've been playing a couple of years that you'd be, you'd be hoping to get into the into the first 15 come, come league of championship. 
Yeah, look, I suppose the fact that Galway have Westmeath and Salt Hill this Saturday, uh, chances are that's an opportunity to maybe continue to have another look at some of these players this weekend. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the Henry will probably look more into weekend, weekend two and three to bring some of the, what we would call, I suppose, the first line players that have been playing in the Walsh Cup back into the team. The bar for this year's scale, given, you know, getting close in the Leinster finals in the last couple of seasons, getting to an All-Ireland semi-final, but kind of finding Limerick is that step uh, too far in those games. Is now like winning a Leinster and getting to an All Ireland final? Is that the barometer now for Galway facing into this year for Henry and the team? I, I think it is. To be honest, I think um, you know championship silverware is the most. Um, and sometimes the Galway people, and I'm guilty of myself at times, they're looking at the Galway teams and and nearly are giving them more, you know, uh, more of a chance than they actually have in reality. If that makes sense, where I'm looking at them and saying, we have a plethora of players, guys. We we have a, we have a whole host of players. We have a huge club. You know, championship huge, huge amount of people to pick from, and you know, it's just, it's just about getting the right, the right team and the right system in place. And I'm, I'm looking at the Aim O'Shea, Aim O'Shea edition, and going, yeah, can he actually help us? So when you asked me last week about, you know, about personnel and Aim O'Shea, mm. I, in truthfully speaking, I'm not looking at personnel as much. I'm looking to see what kind of way Aim O'Shea is a, is adding to the whole training thing to use the per- personnel we have. You know, do you know what I mean? So like we don't have ten new guys that can come in straight away <laughs> and just take down Limerick. So this is a bit of a building process too. So, but for me, we're looking. At the, we need a Leinster final win. Um, the last couple of years haven't been good, and obviously in both fronts we've we played poorly uh, in twenty two and got rightfully beaten. And then last year I thought we did enough to win the game, got beaten again. Just didn't see out there. So I think this year has to be a Leinster Leinster final win, and we have to get over the semi final hump and get into a final. Which is, of course, potentially helped by winning Leinster because in all Usually. likelihood, you would have avoided Limerick the last two years if you'd won Leinster in a semi-final, Usually, yeah. which is a big, big difference. Uh, so Wexford goes to Kilkenny this weekend, Murph. With Kilkenny and what we've seen so far, again, look, Derek has been looking at players throughout the Walsh Cup as opposed to going really hard at it. Uh, but they got to the semi-finals where they lost out against Wexford. I would think the teams from two weeks ago will probably be quite different when they take the field in Nolan Park this weekend. Yeah, you'd imagine so. Um, you'd imagine Derek's Derek's plan will be to have a few um, of the established players mixed with uh, the newer players. I mean, that's really a no-brainer to say. Pretty much every team will be looking to do that. Um, Wexford will pose a challenge, though. You know, Wexford, regardless what team they have at the time, love coming to Kilkenny. They love trying uh, to beat Kilkenny in Nolan Park. The crowd especially love it as well. So I think whatever teams go out, I mean, it's a great one for Kilkenny to focus the mind for the start of the league. Um, it's a great one as well for this, I suppose, new look Wexford team, if that's what you call it, under Keith Roster, for them as well to test their metal and see what way they are. Like, I mean, the Walsh Cup is a great test for younger players that you're blooding, and now here's the next natural step for that, going up to Kilkenny, going to Nolan Park. It'll be interesting to see what teams um, both sides put out as well, but, you know, Kilkenny do have the benefit of potentially throwing a few lads from the Club All-Irelands in there as well. Maybe, maybe it's a bit early. It's hard to know. It's hard to know because... Um, Obviously, those players have had a fairly arduous year as it is. You know, if they're bringing lads in, will they? Will any of them have an influence this year if they haven't been on the panel in previous years? Very unlikely. So, look, there's, there's, there's. You won't be able to read too much into the teams once they're picked this weekend, anyway. But certainly, what both sides will be looking for is that kind of, I suppose, that spark, that little flicker from maybe players that are there the last few years that are looking to establish themselves and that are looking to start off on a good foot, the likes of the Billy Drennans and these with Great League last year. You know, so you're going you're gonna to have a few... That's really, I suppose, the, the, the sparks that people will be looking for. It's what Keith Roster will be looking for. It's, it's what Derek Lane will be looking for. So, look, we won't be able to take a huge amount from these games, but certainly you're looking for a bit of a gutsy performance from players and really that, that I suppose, the heart and the mind is in the right place at this time of year. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting for Kilkenny, Murph, is that, as you said, there's lads who are playing in the three different grades who'll come back into the inter-county setup for Kilkenny now, and we'll see how they're used over the next few weeks. And I think there's some players like Conor Harry who might feel that he's got real aspirations of being a starter in the Kilkenny forward line this year. But also you've got this unusual dynamic, given how good Ballahill Shamrocks have been for the last five or six years, that these guys are coming in hurting for the first time in a while, where they didn't get a campaign, where they won a provincial or went to an All-Ireland final. They've had a break for the first time in a while. And maybe this benefits the likes of Adrian Mullen and Owen Cody going into the season. Yeah, well, what, what, what you can guarantee with these lads now is that they've actually got structured strength conditioning over the last, mixed with a re- recovery schedule as well, over the last um, few months since the county final, which they didn't have over the last few years. You know, So that'll only benefit those. Um, in fairness to the lads, they've been, bar Adrian really, I suppose, who, who had an injury last year, 
you know, the rest of the lads have been fairly injury free. But, you know, ideally for, for Derek Ling, considering those Ballahale boys do really make up the spine of the team, it's great that he's been able to have them for the winter and that he's been able to put a really, I suppose, strong strength conditioning um, basis under them as well for the winter. So it'll be good from the Ballahale point of view. I expect the Lachlan's ads maybe just to have a few more weeks of, of freshening up before they get back into the camp. Yeah. Um, I see questions here. Did Skell quit once you realised that record hadn't been hit? And Skell has replied to say it will be sunrise by the time that this podcast is over. I, don't, I mean, if I can keep it this side of midnight, that would be an achievement at this oh, stage. But look, um, really? just no, no, no. Let, let's just jump around some of the other teams before we finish this Monday pod, OK? Members pod will be available early. That is my promise <laughs> to everybody. <sighs> if I was going to any game this weekend, I'd go to Claren Cork and Ennis. This is going to be interesting, Skell. Um Tell me where you're at with Clare going into this year because they've got lads who are playing Fitzgibbon ball at the moment because Clare have got so many exciting young players. They've, of course, all got college action and they're into the business end of that tournament now. We know that Tony Kelly is going to be out for the entire league. Uh, hopefully he'll be back for the Limerick game. So Clare will probably experiment a little bit. But this is a very interesting game to kind of sharpen the minds coming into it because... Cork will have aspirations of kicking on from last year. They've got a new plethora of young players who are available. Maybe it's about finding that right blend. But I'm interested to get your thoughts on what you think about Clare going into this season. Yeah, like I think both Clare and Cork are, are there are two different stages in their progression. Um, you mentioned about Cork how they have, you know, they've a plethora of young guys, and I'm in full agreement with you. I was saying that they're probably the, the the best team in the country to 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 put a team on paper in a position to 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 contest for the next four or five years. Clare, on the other hand, are in a kind of a, <clears throat> what I call it, a win-now situation. Um, so we know the Clare players. We know, you know, the younger Clare players, the Mark Rogers, et cetera, Adam Hogan's, these guys. But I want to see now what influence the likes of Brendan Bugler and Lucas, uh, the new SNC coach, where they've changed things in the backroom team. Because what, what has gone on over the last two years has been very exciting. It's been excellent for the Clare people, but it just hasn't been enough, if you know what I mean. They haven't got enough out of the group. So do they tailor things off the pitch to try and get that extra couple of percent? Because... Look at the, the margins between themselves and Limerick and Munster. They've been very, very small. We're talking about single percentages when you go into extra time in games, etc. So I don't think it's more looking at the players. I think it's more looking at what kind of tactics will be placed in front of the players and what kind of you know, setup and preparation, etc. to try and steer them in a different direction. Not, not hugely different, but just slightly different to see can they get more out of them. Um, I think they'll use the league to as, as kind of a fundamental base to try and do that, rolling into the championship. I don't think they're going to go all out to win the league. Um, I don't think any team is, to be honest. And they'll use the league as a way to see can we maybe maybe they've got some fresh ideas, some new ideas, some new 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 avenues they want they want to go down with with regards to set up even positional changes for personnel. Who knows? But I think they'll use the league to try and, and, and adapt adapt towards that. Um, and it, it'll be an interesting space to watch because I know the Clare people love Brian Lohan and, and rightfully so. But how much patience do they have? They need they need to win and win now. Hmm. The margins are small, Murph. Let's be fair. Uh, last year. You know, that All-Ireland semi-final, Owen Murphy pulls off an absolute wonder save. Potentially, Clare could have went to the final. If for free is given in the Munster final, maybe Clare get to bring Limerick into extra time. and Maybe they could have won. These are a lot of ifs and buts, and ultimately history remembers the winners. And it's about who came on top at the end of the game, not me making any kind of excuses here. But the fact is that Clare have been very close. The currency for them, though, as Gaila said, has to be Munster glory or getting to an All-Ireland final. At this stage, given how close they are, it has to be a case of getting over the line this year in one, if not both. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, look, if, if, if they win Munster, they're obviously teeing themselves rightly up then to have a, to have a go at the All-Ireland. I think, you know, a lot of Clare fans, not to say they would they would settle for a Munster final, but certainly it'd be huge, you know, to bring the Munster trophy back to, to Clare after... I suppose so many years of not being there and then being so close over the last few years, all those things, um, that'd be huge for them. I mean, at the end of the day, every team wants to go and win the All-Ireland, but I think something at this stage for a player w- would be cherished, really. Um, and I think Munster is the place for them to do it because I suppose a tilt at the All-Ireland will require, does require always, um, you know, a deep panel of players and never more so than at the current time when you have so many more matches than there was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, the the, the easiest one to target, first of all, is the Munster Championship. And that's no brainer. I mean, every Clare fan listening will be saying, of course, we're targeting the Munster Championship. But if they get to there, you know, and give themselves a few extra weeks off um, by not playing a quarter final, 
that'll be huge for Clare if they are do have a serious attempt at the All-Ireland. And like you said, it is all marginal stuff, you know. I mean, very marginal. There's so many things with Clare you could point over the last few years where if only they got a score here or there or free. Um, but I think for any team to, to, to evolve and actually to progress... You kind of just have to take those in the chin and move on. If you dwell on any of those, which I don't doubt the player are for, for a second, you won't progress and you won't develop. Um, so, look, Clare, absolutely. I, I wouldn't judge Clare on their league form at all. Their league form last year, by no means, w- was outstanding. Um, and I don't, I, I think it would actually be unwise for Clare to go hell for leather into a league anyway and try and sustain going, winning the Munster then and trying to win All Ireland. I mean, Scale said it there already. There's no team really going trying to do that. But look for for Clare. I think as well a lot of those players, really influential players. You know, they're they're around the thirty mark going at the other side of it as well. So you'd want those really creative once in a generation player really to. I suppose now is the time to really go and do it because they're not going to be around forever. Yeah, we'll touch on the other teams around the members pod. But Scale, I just want to ask you about Limerick because they've got the bullseye. It's massive on them this year because of the five in a row and all the talk of history that's going to happen later in the year. I'm sure John Kiley, all the players are going to say, oh, this is about one in a row. We're not thinking about it. Yada, yada, yada. All the kind of sound bites that you get. The reality is though, that Limerick seem to be shaping up in a very experimental way into the start of this league campaign. I know they've got Antrim first week. It's in Thurless this weekend as opposed to in Limerick because of the works at the moment of the Gaelic grounds. But when you look at the team that played last weekend in the Dylan Quirk Foundation game against Tipperary, when you look at the teams that were named for the Cork matches that didn't happen, and the other teams that we've seen from Limerick so far this year, it looks like John Kiley is trying to unearth a few early in the year. And like two years ago, that's the mission, as opposed to going hard at winning the league this season. Yeah, as, like if you look at any professional team, professional environment, um, I suppose the first 15, if you want to call that, are only, you know, they only feel as safe as as the, the fifteen behind them pushing. So I think from from Kylie's perspective and his management team, he wants to see number sixteen to thirty and onwards, you know, pushing hard because it creates a level of competition. And like they say, iron sharpens iron. So the more that they're getting pushed from behind, the more they have to up their own levels. And like Kylie's in the same position as everybody else, they're, he's looking for the next person who can go in there and and and, and add to the team because. Like five in a, five in a row is extremely difficult, as as history has proven. Um, it's not that easy to do. <laughs> so. You're looking at guys who may have dips in form, who may suffer injuries, who may have you know, personal issues off the pitch, etc. So there's going to have to be a group of players who are coming from, you know, whether it be youthful, who have been hanging around the panel a couple of years, and they're going to have to make an impact somehow. So that's why I think Kylie's obviously he's using the Welsh Cup. He will use the, the league in the same way to see can he un, un, uh, unearth a couple of these guys. And like, you just don't know what you're going to get because we've seen before where the likes of Limerick, they, they can... They've got Sean Finn back, obviously. They've got Declan Hanlon, who had injury last year. They've got, they got Keane Lynch. So it looks like they're coming from a position of strength. So if you have all these guys available, even with some useful players, will that still result in guys who were dips in form last year you know, stepping out, dropping out, etc.? So I just think it's an interesting space to watch because they've obviously got everyone's attention. Um, everyone's going to look at them. And the media as a whole, and we'll talk about it 100 times over over the next couple of months, is the five in a row, five in a row. Um, but look at, look at their Munster Championship last year. They took a hope with the skin in their, skin in their teeth, so it's not as if it's a done deal, you know. Um, five in a row might materialize out of Munster at all, and it's just, it's just, it's a distinct possibility. And then we could, in the same breath, we could say they could be unstoppable in proper. That's just the margins; like they're so they're so small. So again, in Limerick will be will be an interesting uh, space to watch this year. Mm. So Reedy and Hegarty, really the only kind of frontline players that we saw uh, named around the Munster hurling league. I think they came on at the weekend against Tipperary as well. So there's a load of frontline players to come in. Um, Murph, before we finish up on the first part, I got to ask you about Sean Finn coming back in, the impact he could have there. It's not like it really affected them that much last year because they've got such good defenders that they were able to shuffle everyone around a little bit and make it work. But he's one of the top defenders in the country. This has to be a real boost to have him back fit and firing this year. Yeah, it just, you know, it has a ripple effect the whole way up the field, really. I mean, Sean Finn getting injured last year, very unfortunate. Mike Casey starts crossing the corner back. Dan Morrissey goes full back. I mean, Dan Morrissey really, I suppose, started getting huge credit at the end of last year as to just how consistent he is, how versatile he is. And the fact that Sean Finn is back now, you can imagine Sean Finn sitting back into right corner back. Mike Casey goes to full back and you leave Dan Morrissey back out into the wing again to really get involved in that middle third area. And you have Barry Nash shooting up the wings. Like it kind of naturally picks itself there. Um, but like Sean Finn has been flawless 
for pretty much all his time in a Limerick jersey. So him coming back isn't just a simple case that he goes in and one fella steps out. It actually creates pressure further up the field in that you'll most likely probably have Dan Morrissey going back out into the half-back line. And then lads who are in the half-back line last year now are looking over their shoulder going, actually, am I going to still be here? Well, look, realistically, it's left half-back. He's probably going to go back into. But, you know, it just it, it, it creates more opportunities and more options as well for John Kiley further up the field simply having Sean Finn back there because he's just he, he's, he's just an excellent player mm. okay um we will leave it there for the Monday pod if you want to listen to the members only pod you're going to find out who Paul Murphy's five best ever teammates were we had James Scales last week we had to find out Murph this time around he's back from the skiing slopes he's been writing his list I can see Scales has got paper in the corner of the other side so I reckon he's writing a list probably to go against him to argue he's got better five uh uh, what you got players that played alongside Murph than the man picks himself you are telepathic I had a feeling that was good. Oh, sweet Jesus you're telepathic <laughs> <laughs> I shit right. you not I'm writing <laughs> if you're listening if you're listening to or watching this pod this means I hit record second time round which is good news we'll be back uh, next Monday because we'll have to squeeze on with Scale before he uh, has to navigate the trip to Tenerife and the one thing that the scale gave away a little bit earlier when we were chatting and I don't mind giving this away because he was going to tell people publicly the toilets on the plane are the only thing that worry you James Gal. yes uh, the, 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 the size constraints the space, space constraints it's not that simple you know even when I stand up to do it you know you know what my flipping head I actually lean back because I'm, I'm so tall I can't <laughs> I'm in against the fuselage so yeah not, not, not a simple time with and you add in another little person there that, that doesn't give a shit about anything, mm-hmm. right? And wants to move left, right, central. I could have, I could have a distinct possibility of having the door open the toilet, <laughs> you know. So that, yeah, I, imagine that. Okay, <laughs> imagine that. <laughs> What a note to finish up uh, the Monday pod. Uh, by the way, if Scale swears a little bit more this season, he can fly business class to the Canaries next time around and not have to worry about those toilets. So uh, that is where we will leave it. Uh, it is with thanks, of course, the Hurling Pod with Borgosh Energy. They're the proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. If you get the members pod, you're going to find out a lot more about the best players that Paul has ever played alongside. If not, we shall see you next week. OTB's The Hurling Pod with Borgosh Energy. Proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship.